Hi, thank you everyone. I'm very excited to be here at the SolarPunk conference. So yeah, my first half of the presentation will be an introduction to hydroponics and my experience with sustainable hydroponics. And then the second half will be about the Oikosol project uh, in creating technology blueprints. So why hydroponics? Well, throughout the years, people have done a lot of different types of farming and um, hydroponics came up as a, as a contender for with some very interesting advantages in regards to water conservation because all of the water is recirculated in a hydroponic setting. I actually I forgot to say, but hydroponics basically means cultivating without the uh, soil instead adding the nutrients to a water solution. But there are some advantages, so water conservation, faster growth, because we are supplying all the nutrients already in a plant available form, we can get faster growth from the plants. Um, more control in the different plant stages, this is because we can control artificial light or the nutrient solution. We can have a higher yield, the plant doesn't spend as much energy searching for the nutrients because we already provide them. Um, we also have some space maximization, as you can see in the image. This is because it's also possible to grow vertically more easily. We have reduced labor. It's easier to automate many of the things involved with this type of farming. And we can have fewer pests. Uh, this is because the lack of the use of soil can break some of the life cycles of some insects that can become potential pest issues. But I should also would like to add, every time I introduce someone to the concept of hydroponics, they always wonder, how come you can get the plants to, to grow when their roots are completely submerged? Every time I try to grow my plants in my little pots and I overwater, they just die. Well, this has to do with something that the people uh, figured out uh, some years ago, which is when we overwater plants in soil, we create an environment with low oxygen that can promote the growth of certain bacteria and fungi, which can asphyxiate the roots of the plants. In hydroponics, knowing this, we have several techniques to avoid this problem. Hence, we can grow the plants completely submerged. But there is a lot of different types of farming, uh, and I would like to give you a little bit of an overview so you kind of understand what I will be talking about. We obviously have soil cultivation, where we have been mostly, mostly focusing on intensive agriculture through something called the Haber-Bosch process, which extracts nitrogen from the atmosphere, and other nutrients from the earth, they are extracted. So that is the nutrient source that feeds most of the food that we eat nowadays. On the more organic, ecological and biological type of farming, we have uh, something that tries to use the waste of other processes. So recycling organic waste or food waste or green waste in order to return so uh, nutrients to the soil in order to keep a living soil with other, with, as an ecosystem of microorganisms and plants. So that is basically the side of soil. Now I will try to introduce you to the whole world of hydroponics and it's a big world. Probably when you have heard of hydroponics, you have probably heard of something called mineral hydroponics. And this is somewhat, somewhat similar to our conception of intensive agriculture, meaning we also still need to extract non-renewable minerals from the earth. And that is what we supply uh, by mixing with water to the plants. But as you, as you can see, this is also not very sustainable. So people have been starting to develop what's called organic hydroponics or ways that we can stop being so extractive and start being more recycling. And in organic hydroponics, the biggest type would be aquaponics where we combine fish farming and plants, again, without the use of soil uh, to create a, some sort of synergy. However, the, the source of the nutrients that we ultimately provide in an aquaponic environment still somewhat directly or indirectly rely on fishing. So we extract some sort of fish from the oceans, and then that ends up being the feed that we supply to the fish in that system. Still within organic hydroponics, we have bioponics. Here, it's a bit more similar to the organic ecological bio, biological agriculture with soil, except we're not using soil. So again, we're focusing, how can we recycle waste from other waste streams and provide that as the nutrients for the plants. And lastly, we have anthroponics, where we're focusing on recycling human waste, such as type one or type two. I will be talking a little bit of these in the following slides, but let's start with mineral hydroponics. So how does this work in practice? Here you can see some, some of my own uh, mineral hydroponics that I built in my previous apartment. These are window gardens and you purchase your liquid um, solution or your solid fertilizer and you mix it with water to create your nutrient solution. And then you add it to the system 
And this system has water recirculation as well as some air aeration, active aeration. That's why I'm calling it here active mineral hydroponics. So it's already fairly sustainable in a sense because we are reusing a lot of the water uh, because this water is recirculated and reused as much as possible. However, there are ways we can do better. This is when we entered the domain of passive mineral hydroponics. So here it works a little bit similar. However, there is no recirculation and there is no active aeration of the water. Instead, the full nutrient solution is prepared. And as the plant consumes it, the water level drops and the plant starts developing something called air roots, which help prevent the root rot that could have happened otherwise. So both of these cases, both active mineral hydroponics and passive mineral hydroponics, it's easy to grow vertically, uh, and thus it's very easy to be more productive in space usage. And we can take this even further and start to even reuse the containers themselves where we are growing these passive mineral hydroponics. So you can see here I'm growing chard in a Tetra Pak package, mint in a vodka bottle, bell pepper, and the cherry tomatoes and basil from soda bottles. And the last one I built was a do-it-yourself shelf where I reused old wine bottles to grow some lettuce. So in thinking, how can we reuse the containers themselves? We're trying to lower the carbon footprint, footprint of the, the whole growing. However, the problem still persists that the mineral fert fertilizer itself that we are using is highly unsustainable. And so we must enter the domain of organic hydroponics. The first big one, like I said, is aquaponics. Uh, to explain briefly, the objective of, of, of aquaponics is to create a constructed ecosystem where we manage three different types of life forms, fish, plant, and beneficial bacteria. So the fish are fed through the fish feed, and through their metabolism, they excrete some waste, which is pumped to the location where the beneficial bacteria are or, and where the plants may be as well. And these bacteria will convert this waste into plant available nutrients, which the plants will then filter as the water is then returned to the fish. However, because of this, we also need constant recirculation and aeration of the water because both the fish and the bacteria require oxygen to survive. And as I already mentioned, the fish feed is originating in oceans directly or indirectly, which makes the system somewhat unsustainable. There are some advances in land-based fish feed or in using waste from other processes, but it's still not ideal in terms of a full balanced diet. And this is actually where I began my journey in uh, hydroponics in general. I began by doing my master thesis in aquaponics, as you can see here. Uh, started by building this uh, media bed type of aquaponics where we have the, the lower part where the fish are located and the pump will pump the water to the top part where the beneficial bacteria are and where the roots are in this sort of media type of material. Um, and this mat material is inert, so it doesn't contain nutrients themselves. In this case, we use light expanded clay aggregate and some lava gravel. And this was an indoor uh, system, as you, can, as you can see, which was also very productive. But we also built, uh, me and my coordinator, another, another type of system. This one, we kind of separated the location of the beneficial bacteria from the plant roots themselves. So the water from the pump went to this so-called biofilter, where the beneficial bacteria are. And then it goes across a system of channels made from PVC pipes. This is called the nutrient film technique in hydroponics, and then went to a second productive system called uh, with a floating raft made of styrofoam. This is called the deep water technique or deep water culture in hydroponics. But again, the same, it's always the same concept. You have the fish, you feed the fish, and the water is constantly being recirculated and maybe aerated through uh, the use of an, of an air pump. Uh, and as you can see, this one was also done in a greenhouse. It's also possible to, to do this at a very small scale. Here is a, a system that I had in my previous apartment. And as you can see, it's very compact, even though it was still very productive in terms of, of vegetable growth. However, you do lose the ability to grow edible fish because of the size you cannot have. It would be torture to the fish to have an edible type of fish in that sort of uh, environment. And uh, I also uh, engaged a bit in commercial aquaponics. Uh, in this case, I helped uh, dimension, design, build, and operate Sweden's first CSA vertical indoor aquaponics system prototype. 
quite a mouthful. But uh, as you can see here, it's basically in an office space and it could produce veggies year round. CSA here meaning community supported agriculture. That means we were selling directly to the customers instead of going through a supermarket, for example. And these were indeed very productive systems. As you can see in the top right, I was uh, doing some water tests here. But uh, the advantage of having these sort of ver vertical towers that themselves held the beneficial bacteria in some sort of plastic media inside uh, allowed us to be very compact and to have still most of the office space available to do other activities. And we were growing many, many things. Lettuce, chard, pak choy, basil, oregano, sage, parsley, coriander, cabbage, spinach, and chives, just to name a few. Overall, these are extremely productive systems. I would dare say more productive than mineral hydroponics as well, and more sustainable as well, because the water savings are increased when you have these synergies happening between the fish, the bacteria, and the plants. However, they also do require a bit more energy. With mineral hydroponics, you can get away with some passive action, but here you, you are relying on aerobic organisms like the fish and the bacteria. They need the oxygen to survive. Still within my thesis, I, um, I entered what would be called anthroponics. Anthroponics here meaning deriving from man, in this case, man-made waste. So here the idea is that uh, we take the same design principles a little bit from aquaponics, but we skip the fish. So instead we focus solely on the bacteria or the plants and the plants. And as you can see, we were growing so many things, leafy greens, herbs, tomatoes, cucumbers, strawberries, just to name a few. Um, here, the design, I can explain, it looks very complicated, but it's actually simple. There is a lower point of the system where we added the aged urine, and that would be pumped to either the media bed type of system on the right or the raft system on the left. But before it would reach those systems, it would pass through the towers on top, which would also be producing some vegetables. So here we are combining very different types of hydroponic techniques, uh, and all of this is powered by human urine, which was very intriguing at the time. So after my thesis, I decided that I would do, in combination with the NGO that I was uh, volunteering at, I would do some experiments to explore a bit more what is possible with urine in terms of hydroponic application. And uh, here I operated basically these three parallel media bed type of systems where we added the urine and we would try to grow different things and test different things. The key result of, uh, of many of these, or the main one here, which was the first one we did in 2015, was that we already know that on average, a human adult produces around 1.4 liters of urine in just one day. And through our trials here, we estimated that one human adult could produce almost three kilos of lettuce from the volume of the urine they excrete in just one day, which is a lot of lettuce. Further exploring uh, anthroponics, we're trying to think how can we make the system a bit more lean so here we were able to build a system relying again on the pipe design and the, the bacteria are hosted in what's called the moving bed bioreactor in little plastic pieces of that are floating around in this container and we are making them float around and move and mix through the use of an air pump only. And through a clever design that you can see on the bottom left called an air lift system, just with that air pump that is mixing everything, we can push a little bit of the water to go all the way to the top where the pipe begins and go as a thin film of water passing through the roots of the plants. And in this case, we could uh, save some energy as well in operating this type of system. We also did some experiments in the decoupling, uh, these sort of things here, meaning that instead of having the water constantly recirculating through the, pan through the plants, we will only move the water to the plant area once a week, for example, uh, in order to experiment, can the plants really just rely on that or do they need the constant recirculation? But as you can see, they actually can survive with some aeration added just with the weekly addition of the nutrients. But then I also started to explore a bit more the concept of bioponics. So here was one of the first systems that I built. And the idea here was that we had a vermicomposting system. That is, we would put food waste there and we had some special worms and these worms would eat the food waste and they would produce soil. But in that process, they would also produce a liquid called the leachate, or as we refer to it here, a vermicompost leachate. And using that liquid alone and adding it into this bioponic setting, we were able to grow some lettuce. 
But bioponics doesn't mean you have to stick just with one type of liquid. Here, for example, we had access to something called green waste biogas slurry. In Sweden, where I'm located, we often take the, the green waste from parks to produce biogas, a potent fuel. And sometimes there's this slurry that's left over. Well, we took that and we were able to grow plants again in the hydroponic setting. Uh, we had a very productive system again, as you can see. So it is possible to use many different types of uh, organic waste to produce this liquid fertilizer that we can use and it that is more sustainable than mineral hydroponics. Going back a little bit to the to the vermicompost, that soil that the worms can produce, we thought we had the idea uh, to, to dry it and then to crush it to a fine powder and add that as the nutrient source to, to a hydroponic system or a bioponic system in this, in this case. And it actually worked. Uh, as you can see in this report, the basal grew. We were adding some oxygen because we weren't sure if we were needed the cultivation of any bacteria or not, but it worked. However, the biggest finding when, was when I was trying to do the same with the radishes here on the right image. And in one of the trays, I, I was adding oxygen through the, an air pump, and in the other, I did not. And however, the radishes were still able to grow. So it is possible to use this organic type of hydroponic without active aeration, which is very interesting when we're trying to think about saving energy. And one of my last uh, little experiments with the hydroponics was combining both bioponics and anthroponics, trying to think how can we make a recipe where we take different little types of organic fertilizer to have a very balanced nutrient fertilizer, and then add it to plants. And also here, the design itself of what I was growing in this basil, um, it's a very passive system. There's no active aeration. There's no water recirculation through the use of the so-called Kratky method that is used for passive mineral hydroponics. I was able to prepare this recipe separately in a biofilter and then add it as I would add or water any normal plant with soil in this bucket with inert material but the nutrients were coming from this recipe that I made. So that was the first half. Now I would like to talk to you about uh, another thing I've been engaged a lot with, which is the Oikosol project. And I would like to take the moment to just read to you quickly the mission statement. We believe in the development of affordable, decentralized, sustainable technologies to enable ourselves and other interested individuals worldwide to gain more control and independence in their manufacturing power, their energy source, their food and water source, and in their waste and wastewater treatment. Such control and independence is necessary as we believe in the right to self-sufficiency, regardless of its consequences to existing power structures and distribution networks. We believe that only when every individual has fulfilled their basic physical needs, can they be free to peacefully cooperate with others from a position of equal power, we aim to create a repository of knowledge of localized sustainable technology where everyone is welcome to spread, debate, criticize, and improve on sustainable hope technologies of this repository. The end goal will be to provide free do-it-yourself instructions that allow for most individuals or families living in houses or apartments to become as much energy, food and water, waste, and transport independent as possible. The technologies in these instructions should be as conducive to life overall as possible, as well as affordable for individuals globally. So there's this vision, as you can see, we're thinking most of us live in apartments, how can we create the technologies that allow us to become a little bit more self-sufficient in this way, despite the fact that we cannot just go and live uh, in the farm somewhere. So we recognized five different categories, five main categories, food, water, energy, waste, and transport. And the idea is which technologies can we use that can we make in a do-it-yourself fashion uh, that we can help and then combine so that people can have more sustainable lives. Technologies as diverse as solar stilling engines, aluminum can solar panels, wind belts, fog catchers, mainspring bicycles, solar desalinators, composting toilets, or indoor permaculture. And uh, to start this, I initially made three uh, first uh, instructions. So the idea behind these instructions is that it has as little text as possible. It's more focusing on showing, not telling. And these are open sourced, so people can just take them and make changes to them and follow them along to give you an idea how they look. The idea really is to show, OK, you need to cut here. You need to move this there. You need to get this material. You need to do that. So it's ideally easy to translate as well to as many languages as possible. 
Now, this project used to be on a website, and the idea was that you would arrive on the website and you would see several options about the energy, the food, the waste. You would click, I want to produce my own energy, and you would see the instructions. However, the website was attacked by a botnet some years ago, so the content has been backed up on the GitHub. But the idea is to relaunch the website at some point in the future. And uh, and yeah, they used to the, the way we organize things. There used to be a Trello board where we would uh, put the ideas. But now I have moved onto the the Discord, and I really encourage everybody to to join us in the Discord if you're just interested in talking about technology, the technologies, or what is possible within this project. If you want to show us your little tests of technologies that you have you have done yourself or if you want to help us really create the instructions, which is the ultimate goal, we really need more help in uh, creating these uh, instructions. So yeah, I would like to now open up for some questions if someone has. I know there was a lot to take in, very technical stuff. Uh, we've got three questions for you in the uh, Q&A. So I'm currently in Mexico, where the Chinampa raised fuel have been used for many thousands of years by the Maya. What is the feasibility of creating these as large-scale agriculture production technologies? Were you, well, I mean, if they worked in the past, I would say it's definitely uh, possible again. I am not very familiar. I know that's it originally what inspired the aquaponic designs, these ancient ways to grow the fish and the plants combined. Uh, but I, I'm not sure how large-scale you can make them without a lot of agricultural or land displacement, let's say. But definitely you could probably do it at a smaller scale, I would say. So here we have another question. Aquaponics is only usable for plants growing upwards for potatoes, radishes, or carrots. The system seems unsuited. Uh, no, uh, surprisingly, no. It is possible to grow uh, tubers and things of that nature. Um, I have seen some designs of places where the, the plants themselves, they are using sand as the media, which is very interesting. But you could use it with other inorganic uh, media as well. You ha do, however, have to design it a little bit better because you are using organic fertilizer. There is the risk always that you might start rotting things. So with clever design, you can grow potatoes in an aquaponic system. Here we have hydroponics using urine being used on a space station to grow food there. Uh, not, I would not say in a similar sense. I don't know much about the, the space systems they have. But I do know what they do usually in space stations is they recycle the urine already to create the water. And that's the water they add. Most of the tests they do focus a little bit more on can they, can it grow in a low gravity environment? Here we have one more. What are your thoughts on access to fresh water in Sweden in combination with the great sunlight during the summers, uh, winters? Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I would say it's always best to use the natural sunlight as possible. Most of the, these uh, experiments I have done with hydroponics have been in indoor systems, so we can control a bit for the settings. So we make sure it's not the lack of light that's disturbing the, the thing. But one advantage of, of hydroponics in general, where it's mineral or mineral passive or aquaponics or other types of organic, is that you can extend the growing season because you can do it indoors. And especially in, in colder climates where you don't have the the temperature and the light adequate to grow, you could potentially have fresh food or fresh uh, produce uh, year round uh, if you design the system in such a way that you can take advantage of, it, of its benefits. How do you go about choosing a species of beneficial bacteria and fungi? Well, there is no selection. These, uh, is, we can inoculate something to accelerate the process, but we are using these bacteria that already exist anywhere. So it's not like we take genetically engineered bacteria or something. No, we're just using the bacteria that already exist and designing the system to create an environment where they thrive. Uh, so we, we're not really inoculating something that uh, wouldn't be there otherwise. This is all quite natural. Okay, in anthroponics, do infectious diseases from the urine pose a problem? Uh, yes, so some of the caveats that I do on my research every time I do a technical report or every time I, I answer people about this question is, we, if you want to experiment with this, you should, first of all, collect urine from a healthy individual that is not only not sick, but is not under any type of medication. This is because we currently don't really understand very well, at least I don't have the resources to perform that, that type of research, how that would affect, how that would be accumulated in the plant or how that could come back and affect you in a, in a way. 
So that's also why my research has focused a little bit more in the urine aspect rather than the type two or feces aspect, because with urine, it's usually more sterile. So it's easy also to sterilize, but it's also easier to handle and there's generally less risks to, to use that. All right, how much of a concern is energy uses from grow lights? There is some concern with the, the use of grow lights. However, with the uh, advent of LED lights, which are extremely efficient, uh, it's it's you don't even notice it almost in your in your electric bill basically, and it's very easy to run from from a solar panel or things like that. So before, yes, there was this very unsustainable aspect to it because most of the energy was being released as heat rather than light that the plants could uh, could use for something. But now with LED lights, if you are careful to choose the right LED lights, then uh, it's not really a concern. However, ideally, we st I still try to think of how we can. Uh, we can use designs or we can design things that can use the natural light as much as possible. So you can do hydroponics outdoors just as easily as you can do it indoors. Okay, I think that's most of the questions.